today we're very happy to have also another distinguished guest here today uh, and uh, I will introduce him uh, in a second. Uh, uh, his name is uh, Dan Smallwood. He's uh, a shining star with uh, ConocoPhillips. Uh, he serves currently as the manager of technology and development in the Arctic and deep water Gulf of Mexico for ConocoPhillips. Uh, as you, many of you are familiar with the company, but it's a, a very large energy and gas exploration and production company. They are operating currently in about 30 uh, countries, as well as having about 17,000 people working for them. Um, they are, uh, as I said, uh, committed in the efficient and effective exploration of production in oil and natural gas, as well as they focus very much on safety. Uh, and we will hear later uh, more of what, what they do. Um, Mr. Smallwold, he uh, really uh, has an impressive list of uh, achievements in his personal as well as in his uh, professional career. Uh, in, during his professional career, he served also as, as the chief operating officer of Marine Well Containment Company. Uh, many of you uh, probably are familiar with that company that uh, keeps us safer in the Gulf of Mexico uh, and was founded after the uh, oil spill to making sure that we have uh, uh, a very good response mechanism uh, when uh, something similar with uh, with the core. Um, also, uh, he was the manager prior. He was the manager uh, for the upstream assets in the Gulf of Mexico, Louisiana, East Texas, and also he managed the wetlands in South Louisiana. Uh, he has uh, also done some work in Wyoming, Louisiana, uh, Alaska. So. Uh, and we're going to do the Q&A later, so he's giving a presentation, later we're going to do the Q&A. So, but without further ado, please let's welcome Dan Smallwood. Good morning. And, uh, thank you. It's a, a great honor to be in front of this group and uh, back in New Orleans. I've lived in uh, Louisiana for about 11 years of my life, uh, two years in New Orleans, and uh, good to be back. Uh, didn't want to leave when we had to leave the first time. So, and uh, the, the, we do have one request, though. I did hear that Jerry Jones wants his defensive coordinator back. So, if someone gets that <laughs> after last night, and, uh, but uh, as a Texans fan, we do want to keep the bags from the Inks for a while. It's, it's, it's not been good. But uh, it's good to be back in New Orleans. It's good, good to see the Saints back on top, too. So I definitely still root for the Saints. So today, my topic is going to be talking about the energy revolution. And, and then I'll, I'll kind of end talking a little bit about the Gulf of Mexico, which is uh, more near and dear to my heart and my role right now. So I'm going to start out with a cautionary statement. Uh, it's like the F FBI warning on your video. There's, this is the SEC warning on my presentation. Uh, there will be forward-looking uh, statements that, uh, from the, the slides. Those are no guarantee of previous, past, or current or future performance. And I think as you look at some of the slides, it'll become pretty apparent because if we were given this speech back in 2004, 2005, the outlook for the energy industry is quite a bit different than it is today. So I think we already have a track record that uh, predicting the future is not easy. So real quick, at a high level, we'll talk about, I'll give a real quick, just a one slide review of ConocoPhillips, the company, and Dominic uh, covered quite a bit of that, and talk a little bit about ConocoPhillips since the split from our downstream, uh, the Phillips 66 company that has now been spun off. And then really start with the, the revolution, really started on the gas side. So we'll talk a little bit about the gas side, what that now means for LNG exports versus the imports we were talking about a couple years ago. And then how this energy revolution is now spread into the shales and the oil shales. And then and now we're, we're looking at where we actually are, uh, the, that peak oil is not necessarily back in the 70s anymore. Maybe the peak oil for the United States is actually just uh, a little bit ahead for us. We'll talk about that. And then uh, talk a little bit about offshore. And, and, and not only is the revolution coming from the shale plays and gas and oil, but it's also going to be coming from the deep water. And as you all know, Louisiana and, and New Orleans, this is a gateway to the GOM. Always has been and, and will continue to be the gateway and, a, and an important part of our business. And uh, talk a little bit then again about the challenges because uh, everything you know, is a good time right now in the energy industry, but we do have challenges ahead that, that we have to manage and, and be ready to respond to. And then take some Q&A. 
So a little bit on, on our profile, uh, May of 2012, ConocoPhillips Company uh, spun off its downstream assets. So Phillips 66 is the entity now that has our downstream assets, refining and midstream. Uh, the upstream company kept the name ConocoPhillips, uh, but we are a pure play E&P company now. So we're, we're only in the exploration production business. Uh, we, as Dominic said, we are managing in 29 different countries. Uh, but we are very much focused in the OECD uh, countries. That, that's, uh, the bulk of our assets are in those. The bulk of our investments continue in those. And, and that's driven quite a bit by the shale plays, some of our conventional assets that we have in Alaska, the U.S., the North Sea, Asia Pacific, and then also being driven by the, the growth that we're hoping to have in the, the Gulf, of water, Gulf of Mexico deep water. Um, we have about 18,000 employees, so we're still very large. We are the, the largest independent U.S. oil company, uh, which gives us a unique position because we're, we're, we sit between the majors that are integrated and some of the smaller independents. But uh, we feel our size gives us the advantages to be able to operate and operate efficiently. So jumping to the shale plays, there's roughly 20 different shale plays under development right now. But as you can see, there's more than 20 shale plays that are mapped by the USGS and others on this. But some of these are familiar. We're seeing the headlines every day. Uh, the Eagleford play in South Texas, the Marnette play up in uh, North Texas, uh, the Haynesville, which really kind of kicked some of this off up in North Louisiana, uh, and then the Bakken play in, in North Dakota. And Bakken and Eagleford are really getting a lot of attention because they're really oil, the oil shale plays. You know, this, this shale play, as you'll see in the next few slides, really kicked off with the Haynesville, the Marcellus, the Utica, some of the ones that were more gas rich. But as you can see, it covers a large footprint of, of the U.S. And it, this really makes the U.S. the envy of the world. The, the ability that we have now to become more energy independent from exploiting these, these uh, shale plays, both with the gas and the oil, and, and with the private land ownership we have that allows us to be able to develop it probably quicker than we can in a lot of other countries. So what has it done to the gas side? Uh, like I said, if, we were, if we're sitting back here in 2005 and you looked at kind of that blue portion of that wedge, it was kind of a depressing time from the U.S. side. Uh, we were talking about LNG, but we weren't talking about LNG export, we were talking about import. And at that time, I don't remember the, the number of terminals that were being proposed, but I think it was in the dozens that we're, they're being proposed to import uh, gas from everywhere else. And as you can see, that I think even some of that non-shale production uh, has flattened out through technology. So I think the curve, even back in 2005, was probably even steeper than that. But the red really shows what's happened with the shale revolution. Uh, we've not only arrested the decline, we've actually got an increase going. And as you see, we're now actually starting to outstrip the demand for natural gas, which is why now all of a sudden, as you look to the right, uh, the EIA data is showing all of a sudden we're going from being a net importer of natural gas projected from 15 to 2020 and beyond to now, basically we're almost at the, we're just a couple of years away from basically where our supply is going to exceed our demand. And that's why you're hearing a lot now about LNG export. So when you look at the liquefaction side, what's happened with it, with those expectations around excess supply? Uh, right now there's 33 export terminals that are being proposed around the, the U.S. and in North America. Uh, those 33 terminals, if you add up all that capacity, would be about 45 billion cubic feet per day, which is about half of the U.S. Uh, production. So obviously not that many export terminals are going to get produced. There's not going to be that kind of excess uh, capacity. As you saw, it was probably 6 to 10 billion from the, the slide it was provided. Uh, that's probably what we expect because the, the global demand seen over between now and 2025 is about 30 billion standard cubic feet. Uh, North America will not get all that, uh, will not be filling all of that. So the expectation is a number of these export terminals will not go forward. Um, you know, the, some of the early movers will, and no doubt a lot of these will get built to take that excess supply and move it into the markets. But even though we have very low cost, you, there's a lot of articles talking about the low cost for natural gas, and it is low cost domestically. But when we try to transport that to the marketplace, and, and primarily in Asia Pacific, our transportation costs eat up a lot of that cost advantage that we have. So when you, you compare it to Australia, which right now is having a lot of large gas projects being developed uh, with LNG. And then a lot of the recent discoveries, Mozambique that you've probably heard a lot about with the discoveries there in East Africa. 
actually has a lower cost of original supplies. You can see they're getting into the three dollar cost of supply where the, the in the U.S. side we're closer to four and probably I think a little bit over four right now. But they have the advantage of location. You know, geographic location makes a huge difference and it's kind of uh, not probably too much of a surprise and when you look at the top the, the cost to actually get a, a MCF of gas from the, the source to the customer really isn't that much different between it. So it will be a competitive market for that global demand and, and thus we probably will not, we know we will not be probably seeing 33 terminals, um, but we will see hopefully a number of terminals getting developed for export. And then, so the, the gas side is rosy. All of a sudden uh, we have an abundance, uh, you, you hear quoted quite a bit, the 100 year plus supply of natural gas and, and the, the forward curves definitely show that. Very similar story now on the oil side. The oil side's just now really starting to merge. It's a, a couple years behind, and, but it came out. And again, if you kind of looked at the, the lower 48 crude curve, we had the peak oil that everyone talked about in the, the late 60s, early 70s. And, and I can't remember a lot of people philosophizing at that point in time that peak oil had been reached. I know when I uh, went to college in the late 70s, early 80s, a lot of my friends, I grew up in Florida on the Gulf Coast, and they're like, why in the world would you go into this business? It's a dying business. And, uh, and, I, and I just looked around me and with a little bit of education that we didn't get in high school, I said everything around us is made with oil or natural gas or, or needs that fuel to make it. So I said, it may be dying, but I said technology will, will get us there. And probably didn't quite understand the, the magnitude of what was going to come and the fact that over three decades we'd see a lot of uh, peaks and valleys. But really, you know, that peak oil was arrested a little bit when we brought Alaska online in, in the late 70s and the early 80s. Uh, but that peak, and then that flat only lasted for a little bit of less than a decade, and then we were back on the decline again, uh, including the NGLs from the, the gas processing. But look what's happened since 2009. Uh, as we're developing these shale, shale plays and moving from the gas ones to the oil, all of a sudden just the Bakken, the Eagleford, and, and the liquid rich uh, gas plays, the, the steepness of that curve is just to me amazing. It's almost mind boggling that we were able to, to ramp up that fast. And, you know, projections are in the next couple of years we will set a new peak, new records for production in the, the U.S. for crude. And it's not just restricted to the shale plays. You know, let's look at the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico really since 1990 has been on an incline. Uh, you know, we've, we had a very good run-up for about a decade through 2000. Uh, then it kind of dropped off a little bit as some of those projects started hitting their, their peaks and uh, a little bit of timing between projects coming online, especially in deep water where a project now is a significant large volume that one project will make a difference in that curve. Uh, you see a little bit of the downturn from a condo. The, the, the moratorium and the, the slowdown probably pushed us back a, a year or two. But now you're starting to see that ramp up in the projection as new projects, new discoveries are being uh, proposed to come online. You know, and again, not quite as steep as that unconventional curve, but a very good incline again. And, and when matched with the unconventional plays and the shale plays, is again a very positive fit picture for oil production. So the bottom line is the, the U.S., where instead of us looking at OPEC and saying they're the major producers, guess what? We're now the major producer. Uh, we are now the largest natural gas producer in the world, uh, surpassing Russia and, and by a pretty good margin. Uh, on the, when you look on the crude side, the crude side is looking at about a four year, the, the past four year window and again the growth in the U.S. for crude production in the last four years is double the number two co country which is Russia. And, and if you look at number three, our neighbor to the north, Canada, if you combine those two together, obviously North America is leading the resurgence in, in production and, and offsetting a lot of the losses that we're seeing in other places in the world. And then adding the Canadian picture in there, so we've got the unconventional oils, we've got the deep water oils, and then we have the oil sands that are really the, the mega projects that are going on in the oil sands and some of the smaller projects are really just now starting to, to ramp up and come, on, come online. And you're really kind of seeing again the growth in the oil sands production through, from 2013 forward. Uh, the, the nice part with the oil sands, these are heavy crews. Uh, if we think about most of the, the oil sand, oil shale plays, most of the Gulf of Mexico, these are light sweet crudes. Uh, the refiners over the years have really blended, have built their refineries and the processing around a blend of taking lower cost heavy crudes and blending them with the light crudes and, and then being able to have a better margin on their product. 
so when we look at this, if you will, this surge that we have in the light sweet crudes coming from the oil shales and expected to be coming from deep water, um, it's nice to have a stable supply of the heavy crudes to the north of us. So combined, when, when we look kind of the North America picture bringing the U.S. and Canada together, uh, the demand curve's kind of flattened out, as you see. And we're starting to see the effects of the fuel efficiency standards. Um, just the, the efficiencies and the technology gains are, are projected now to really keep the demand flat in North America. So with flat demand in North America, growing oil production, growing gas production, uh, hints the call for exports and uh, exports of gas. And, and as you can see here, uh, very soon, by 2015, 2016, the projection is that our crude production will exceed the demand. And again, the, the, hence why you're now hearing the discussions and the, the debate about should we be allowing exports of crude from the North America and from the U.S. specifically. But the nice part is, it, you know, the oil independence we talk about in the U.S., well, at least from a North America standpoint, it, it is right in front of us. It's, it's not a, a mirage anymore. And definitely not something we were projecting in 2005 when it, it almost looked like we are going to be importing a large, large part of our energy source. So it's a great picture. You know, the, the energy industry is doing well. Uh, access to resource is very good for us in North America. Uh, it's created a, a tremendous amount of jobs, tremendous amount of opportunity. It's helping us reduce the, the trade imbalance for fuels, but but it doesn't. It, but it's not always easy. It's as you would expect. There are lots of challenges out there. Uh, the, the recovery from 2008 hasn't happened in North America yet. So you kind of saw that flat demand curve. You know, we we haven't seen a resurgence in manufacturing. Everything else yet hasn't really materialized yet to, to start driving more demand locally. So hence. If we do have domestic production growing, then we've got to find a place to market that production. Uh, we have permitting delays. Uh, I think everyone's well aware of Keystone. And to be able to get that Canadian crude down and get that blend that the refiners are looking for from a stable source, we, we really need to have that pipeline to be able to move those crudes to the south and to where the refining is here on the Gulf Coast. Um, so we've, we've talked a little bit about the import-export needs, and we also have stakeholder issues. The, the fracking concerns that we, we read about in the press is something that, as the industry, we need to continue to address, educate, and then provide that assurance, the education and the assurance that it, it can be done safely and it is being done safely. And then we, are, we have the, the anti-development folks that just say we should be moving completely away from fossil fuels. It, and our approach on that is very similar to everyone else, is it's really all in. As we look at global energy demands, you know, we're going to not only need this production, we are going to need renewable growth uh, as well as growth in other energy sources. You know, we're going to need all of it. It's, it's not an either or. So uh, the fossil, fossil fuel by itself, the other, demand, other sources for fuels would not be able to, to replace that demand as we see it. The biggest issue we've got, and I think visiting with a lot of you this morning, I, I think isn't just limited to the oil field. It's especially with the petrochemical and manufacturing, it's uh, the workforce. Where are we going to find that trained workforce as we have, now we're, we're seeing it already with the resurgence in the oil industry of trying to find the trained young workforce to replace the baby boomers that are retiring. As we expect the manufacturing boom to occur and the petrochemical boom that's now occurring, it's going to be the same issue. You know, where are we finding those trades that we need coming out of school and hopefully having enough time to overlap with the baby boomers that are getting ready to retire to be able to do the training and, and the assurance and the competency that we need to, to build that. And I personally believe that's our biggest issue facing not only our industry, but I think the U.S. in general is, is the workforce demographics and, and getting that trained workforce. And it sounded, visiting a lot of you, that's, that's pretty common for your companies and your industry. Uh, last. Uh, Government policy. Uh, you know, we constantly we are being singled out as an industry for taxation increases, um, and what we really want is just that level playing field. You know, let's let's have sound policy that promote, promotes growth, and, and we know this energy growth and the low cost energy in the U.S. will drive manufacturing, and, and that will create jobs, not only in our sector but in all sectors. And that uh, picking, picking technology winners should be done by the marketplace. Let the marketplace. We'll truly decide which technologies are winning and, and providing the value and the assurance that we need. So now I want to step into the Gulf of Mexico and deep water, an area that's definitely comfortable for me and, and definitely a 
vital interest, I know, for New Orleans and Louisiana. You know, this kind of depicts the, the march that we've had in the Gulf of Mexico since the 40s, when we, we started developing the shelf and scared to death that we were out of line of sight of land. I remember the, when you read the old headlines back in the 40s that, wow, we were putting people on platforms overnight and they couldn't see land. And, you know, now we're putting them 200 miles out from land. It's just a march that we've had in a really a short amount of time, if you think about it, just 60 or 70 years. We've gone from producing in 30 or 40 feet of water to now almost 10,000 feet of water. Uh, with the Perdido, I think it's 92, 9,400 feet of water that uh, Shell's producing at a Perdido. A, a, a tremendous march in the technology advancements that's uh, allowed that to happen have just been amazing and continue to require us to advance technology. So why, are, why do you see this resurgence in deep water given what's going on in the shale plays? Well, the true reason is value creation. This is a, a Wood McKenzie uh, study that was done looking at just value creation over a 10-year period for lots of the oil companies. And the blue bar represents the value creation from deep water. So if you look, all the largest value, the, the companies with the largest value creation, more than half of that came from deep water. Uh, you know, when you look at Petrobras with the, the Atlantic margin that they have in, uh, with the Brazil play and a campus base and et cetera has really driven them. Chevron with the success they've had in the Gulf of Mexico, deep water and other areas. Anadarko has had a lot of success in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, more than half of those companies that show more than 50% of their growth from deep water, that growth was from the Gulf of Mexico deep water. It is a good place to be, it's driving value creation. Uh, our company, unfortunately, you kind of see us way over to the right side, uh, hence why we're getting back into the deep water Gulf of Mexico. We want it as part of our portfolio, and uh, we've built a very large exploration portfolio that we're getting ready now to actually start exploiting with the drill bit, and our hope is to uh, add a big blue bar to ours to add with the success that we've seen in the shale place. So when we look at the Gulf of Mexico, how are we going to fuel this, this continued success that we have had and that we need to continue to have as we march into deeper waters, higher pressures, higher temperatures? First and foremost, you know, we have to improve process safety. And, and I'll cover each one of these in a, a future slide here. But as an industry, we have to do better on the process safety side. We also need to start driving greater standardization of equipment. Uh, it's one thing when we look at the unconventional plays or even the shelf where we had hundreds if not, and thousands of wells, if you will. You know, the ultra deep water is not going to have that many facilities. They're going to be large facilities with large volumes, but small count. So we can't afford to have serial number one repeated 10 times. We really need to start driving standardization. And we also need greater collaboration between the companies. And we've seen some of that before with oil spill response. We definitely saw some of it during and after Macondo with some of the well containment. We need to continue that and, and not have it not only for emergency response, but also to be driving some of the standardization and the process safety improvements. And then obviously continuing technology development. We get into harsher environments, deeper waters, higher pressures, temperatures, tighter rocks. It's going to take technology to help make that economic. So this is the one slide, it's probably the depressing slide in my, my pack. Uh, this is not the trend that we want to have in our industry. This is looking at upstream losses uh, from a financial standpoint and the trend in, in four-year or five-year increments. And that trend is going the wrong direction. Um, these incidents are, are occurring across, but there's a lot of common root causes as we see it. We really need to get back to the operational assurance. It, it requires better training. And so when we look at the workforce demographics, that even puts even more requirements for us to do a better job in training. We need to do a better job in collaboration. We need to do a better job in industry and risk assessment and mitigating those risks. Um, and, and bottom line is, you know, this is the type of stuff that we've got to keep focus on every single day. Uh, price cycles go up and down, you know, the, as the oil cycles go up and down, you know, as we're producing every day, we have to keep, keep our eye on process safety. And we've done a great job in the industry. When you look at the, the, the recordable injury rate has been dropping almost on the same type of trend if you look at it. And, and we probably all became very comfortable looking at that and going, we're doing better. Well, we were doing better on the slip trips and falls and the minor injuries, but we obviously have lost focus on, on the large process safety events that have much bigger magnitudes in terms of the environmental damage uh, people and the safety and the, the asset integrity. 
I touched a little bit on standardization, but one thing we got to stop doing is reinventing the wheel. If, if I look in deep water, it looks like we had one of everything. We've got spars, and we've got four or five different types of spars. We've got different types. Everyone had their own design on a TLP. Everybody has their own des design on a riser system. If you talk to the subsea manufacturers, every single company that comes to them will take someone else's tree and then say, yeah, I like it, but add this widget, that widget, change this. And it drives the cost, obviously, of the goods and services up. When we aren't mass building these things, we're building them as serial number one over and over again. But it also doesn't help us on the training side. It's going to be a lot more effective for us to train the workforce and drive safety improvement by having standardization where it makes sense. It'll help us on maintenance cost and reliability. Um, it, and no doubt, it's, it's something we need to do. We are doing it in, in places. Uh, individual companies, I think, are doing it better now. I think as we look at the unconventional plays, all of us started out with lots of different designs on our facilities for the unconventional plays. We're now trying to get down to standard four or five standard designs for tank batteries and those type producing facilities. We need to just drive that same thing on the offshore side. And again, it's going to have to be done through collaboration industry groups and working with the service sector and the manufacturers to help drive that with us. Greater collaboration. Uh, I had, I had the honor, the blessing, actually, to be the, the chief operating officer for Marine Well Containment and getting that company up and running. And that was a, a, a huge challenge because we really were starting that while Macondo was, was still ongoing. But we knew as an industry that we did not have the equipment we should have had in place. Uh, you know, the capping stack was a great device that ultimately <coughs> shut in that production. And it's something that we said we need to make sure is readily accessible. And not only is it readily accessible, but we've got company and people that are trained on how to use it and the regulator has actually incorporated that into the, the approval process for drilling permits that, that you have to have, you know, the, the, build, the training and access to the capping stack. So two different capping stack uh, entities did get created, Post Macondo, the Marine Well Containment Company, ConocoPhillips was a founding member of that, we have 10 member companies that are members of Marine Well Containment Company. Uh, the other entity is the Helix Well Containment Group. Um, to operate in the Gulf of Mexico deep water, you have to have access to one of those capping stacks to be able to get your well permits. So that's an improvement we've had on, on making sure we've got the safeguards in place to re reduce the amount of um, pollution, environmental damage that we would have if we had a loss of well containment. Um, we've always had that in the past. If you looked at oil spill response, all the oil spill response we typically have in the Gulf of Mexico has been done through kind of joint venture set up by the oil companies. You know, the MSRCs and the clean gulfs, et cetera, were set up that way, but we really didn't have that in place for really large well containment. So now we have that in place for, for not only containing the well, but then also for the surface cleanup. But it doesn't need to stop there. We need to have th that same thing. We need to look at for more places as we look at how do we mitigate risk and try to do it consistently and, and raise the bar for everybody is look for other opportunities like this to, to be able to do that. And then technology. Um, my, my previous role, I'm actually now managing the, the Gulf of Mexico deep water for ConocoPhillips. Prior to that, I was managing our technology programs for the Arctic and deep water. And the deep water uh, technology has changed quite a bit. Our last asset that we uh, developed and uh, installed in the Gulf of Mexico was in 2004, the Magnolia TLP. And it's just amazing, the, the ten-year window now, what's changed between then and now. Uh, although subsea developments were occurring in deep water at that point, they were fairly short tiebacks, you know, they, and they were basically natural flow tiebacks at the point. Uh, people were talking about putting artificial lift, ESPs, and others in place. But now we're installing things like this on the seabed. You know, the, what you're seeing there, that is a, a three megawatt subsea boosting pump that can boost about 25,000 barrels a day. Uh, from a well, so we can pull wellhead pressures down and either send that up you know, to a host facility and or transport it quite a long ways. You know, part of the boosting is also being looked at not just for the deep water but for Arctic where we would need to have long transportation and be able to add artificial energy, if you will, to be able to boost it. Uh, technology now is driving these to be six megawatt pumps. So now we're looking at pumps that could push up to 50,000 barrels per day uh, long distances and or to high pressures to get up. This is just one of the, the emerging technologies, and these are being done through JIPs and, and through collaboration because the, the cost of development is high, and because we know there's not going to be a lot of these installed in deep water, so we definitely can't afford for every company to have a different one of these. The, the manufacturers, uh, first, they would not be interested in even going into this business because there's not going to be enough of them built, and they sure can't afford to design 16 different versions of it. So 
this is a type of R&D that we really are looking for the competitive space through collaboration to really drive the advancements. Um, but it's not just in, on the subsea side. Uh, BOP reliability is something we've got to work on in, as, an, as an industry. Uh, the regulations post Macondo have really tightened the, the reliability requirements and the maintenance requirements on BOPs. And the performance that we're seeing now because of, because of that is not good on the BOPs. We've got to improve the performance of that, that tool for us to be able to reduce the non-productive time we've got on these drilling wells. Uh, drill ships right now are running five to $600,000 a day for the ship itself. So your spread rate, including all your drilling vessels, support vessels and all that are pushing almost a million dollars a day. I can't afford to have a BOP uh, being unreliable and taking several days to fix something that we, we really could be able to fix that and put some focus on it. So there's industry focus on that now. We just need to continue to push that harder because that's an, not only an important piece for risk mitigation, but it's a very important piece to keep our productivity up. And then as we go into deeper and deeper waters, no surprise, our, our, our pipes coming up to those facilities, the moorings to hold those facilities in place, the requirements for those, the strengths for those just continue to increase. One slide on the Arctic. Uh, the, the Arctic's gotten a little bit more attention, obviously, in the, the last few years. Um, and, and the main reason why is it's deemed to be one of the largest, if not the largest, undiscoverable petroleum basin that really hasn't been exp you know, explored and or developed at this point. Uh, USGS has predicted up to 13% of the remaining undiscovered petroleum may be sitting up in the Arctic, and a large part of that being gas, a, a large gas focus. Uh, you're seeing right now what really is driving right now is exploration is being done in what I kind of call the easy Arctic. It's where we have the first year ice. It's where we're ice free, usually in the summer conditions, so we can come in and explore in the ice free, find out if we actually have some potential there that then would drive what we would need to do for appraisal and development. So really right now, industry is really kind of in that infancy of how big is the resource, where is that resource, and we're really starting with the easy Arctic, but we know as we advance we're going to have to have technology advancements uh, to be able to deal with the ice loads and measuring the ice, tracking the ice. It, it looks like a giant sheet of ice, but that giant sheet of ice is actually moving as it's melting and refreezing and forming and, uh, and being able to measure how it's moving, tracking where it's moving, uh, the loads that it's going to exert on any facility. And in the unfortunate event, if we do have an oil spill, we've got to be able to track the oil that, that could be embedded in that ice. So using the satellite technology, the subsea technology, et cetera, and being able to do that. And then how are we going to recover any spill product on, on that ice? So a lot of work going on in that. It's another place where we have collaboration going on in the industry. We have nine companies working together through the oil and gas producers group uh, out of Europe. ConocoPhillips is one of those. But we're looking at multiple uh, techniques and multiple tools and processes around how are we going to both prevent oil spill from occurring in the Arctic, but what will we do if we do have an oil spill to be able to contain it, capture it, and, uh, and prevent the environmental pollution. So the contributions. Uh, this rosy picture is not just helping us on the, tr the trade imbalance, but it's a huge employment. Our industry employs about 9.8 million U.S. jobs, and the forecast is by 2030 that will increase another 1.4 million jobs if, with the, the growth, if we can have this growth and also get some of the Canadian crude coming down through the pipeline. Uh, we're a large part of the uh, GDP, as you see, 8%. Um, and lower gas prices, we expect, are going to just fuel further increases in GDP by manufacturing growing in the U.S., coming back to the U.S. because of the low-cost fuel, as you saw compared to some of the other countries, or Europe's prices. Um, and we pay revenues. You know, we hear a lot about the, the taxes on our industry, but uh, I, my iPad and my iPhone, I don't think would calculate what $86 million is times 365, but I think it's a pretty big number that the industry <coughs> contributes uh, to taxes, which is good. Well, you know, that also helps us stimulate the economy and provide for the social programs, defense, and other things for the U.S. government. So uh, we think it's a great business, not only creating jobs, but also providing tax revenue for the country. So in summary, what I really kind of key takeaways is we're seeing the, the, the rise in U.S. production, both on the gas side, which is what really started, but now on the oil side, and, and hence why you're starting to hear the the call for exports and, and the decline in imports. We really are changing that trade imbalance 
to the point that uh, overall, when you add the oil and gas together, we may be becoming a, a net exporter in North America when you combine with the Canadian production. Um, the deep and ultra deep Gulf of Mexico remains active. You know, I remember people talking about it being the Dead Sea about two or three times. Charlie can probably remember how many times did we think oh, the Gulf was on its leg because the, the creaming curve said we'd flattened out and then came deep water and then flattened out and well we're, we see the resurgence again. So we're probably back on our third, fourth, fifth, if you will, creaming curve for the Gulf of Mexico. It continues to be a great basin and, and Louisiana continues to be a great venue for to help us uh, produce in that basin. Uh, we see the U.S. as a logical market for that Canadian crude. That Canadian crude is going to go somewhere, as we see it. If that pipeline doesn't get approved, that crude doesn't move here, Canada is going to find a place to move that crude to a market. Um, we see it as an ideal because it provides us a reliable, stable source of the heavier crudes we need to blend with the lighter crudes for our refinery slate that we have, in, especially along the Gulf Coast. It's a logical fit. And then we really believe government policy should continue to favor the development we're seeing in the unconventionals, the development we need and in, in the infrastructure to continue to make that happen and continue to look at the opportunities for exporting crude. And, uh, but at the same point, and I think that last bullet is probably the most important bullet, as we learned just a couple years ago, we, we can't sit back and just enjoy the rewards of what's going on. We've got to continue to improve on our assurance, our collaboration, uh, working together with, with the regulatory agencies to make sure we're raising that bar not for everybody to make sure we're doing the best we can to safely operate and provide the environmental assurance to our stakeholders. And I think that's the end of the presentation. So I think Dave, we just taking questions there. Uh, I think we just go ahead and uh, start with questions. Sure, I guess yep. with the increase in uh, production over a flat demand, um, what do you see on the refining side is coming down the pike and then if exports take longer to really become a reality uh, because of the permitting issues and the delays in Washington, wh where does all this product go? Uh, like there's a glut that, that could be there, whether it's temporary or, or long term. Yeah, and I, and I think it, it, like most markets, if you get a glut, then prices will drive down, which will then slow down development is, is how we see the picture. I, you know, since we spun off the downstream, not really familiar with what, what their strategy is right now, but you know, I know they are definitely supporting trying to, to get the lower cost you know, heavies in to be able to t take advantage. Because as we see it, the, you know, the light sweet crews are a higher value product than than the, the heavies are. So in the ideal world, it, no matter what the commodity is, you'd love to export your, your higher value product and export a, or import a, a lower value product. And, and that for the refineries, that's I'm sure probably fits quite well with what they're looking at too, is they're, they're trying to find the lowest cost <coughs> feedstock they can for the process uh, that their refinery's been set up for. Uh, along the same, same line there, We've got a law in the books in the mid 70s that says that you can't export crude other than Canada, possibly the Virgin Islands. What, uh, what do you see the industry doing through API or other means to try and at least lay the groundwork for repealing that law? I think that's, I think that really, is, I think we're at the beginning stages of that in the industry and using API and other industry groups to really address it as an industry. Um, just because we all see the same curves. You know, all the graphs that I showed you really are industry or analyst curves are not conical Phillips curves. So we're all seeing the same data. Um, so it becomes clear that if we want to continue this development pace that, that, that either if we don't have the ability to export, we're going to drive down prices and slow down that pace. And uh, that, that production growth that's needed on a world basis is going to come from somewhere else. And, and seeing some of the majors backing out of the shale properties, the uh, Exxon Shell, uh, because it's not profitable. Is this because of the flood or the supply? Uh, I think it's more people where your position is in the shale place. You know, did you get the sweet spots? So not all shales equal. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing oil shale, oil rich shales versus ones that are more drier gas. And each of those shale plays have sweet spots that have higher production rates per well than others. And, and some of them just probably didn't have as good a position in it, and or probably had other opportunities. You know, for us, 
uh, it, it is a large part of our growth plans is the, the shale plays and particularly the oil shales with the Bakken and the Eagleford. Two questions. Was it kind of cool the first to bring a TLP in the Gulf with a dollar? Yeah, the Jolie Yes, yeah. yeah. the very first. And my next question, the uh, decline of the petrochemical facilities in the 80s and 90s, uh, with all this crude coming in, where do we stand on being able to refine our product? Is that increasing with building new plants now, or, is, or are we going to be maxed out? I'm probably not the right, the right one to answer that, but I know talking to some people, it sounds like the, the petrochemical industry is picking up in Louisiana, so talking to others here, so I'm not the right one to address it, but I, I think we're, we're, we're seeing that surgence in, uh, in petrochemical coming back with that supply and, and the low-cost natural gas for the fuel stock. You see growth in deep water, but you don't see the public companies staying in shallow water and being replaced by private companies? Yeah, I think it's just the size of the opportunities. Uh, if, if you think about just reserve replacement for the large companies, you know, we, we're, we're looking for the larger fines. And uh, as you saw kind of from the growth slide there for deep water, deep water's providing that, uh, the ability to find hundreds of millions of barrels in a, a field. Uh, we were just not able to, have not found that recently in the shelf. Uh, when I look at the Gulf of Mexico, it doesn't mean that uh, there won't be a resurgence at some point with advances in technology, but right now the focus is on primarily deep water for the larger companies. Being involved in, I think you said, 29 different countries, uh, you must have some insight as to what the other oil shale formations outside the United States uh, portend for the industry. Uh, are you involved in those in Asia, Russia, places? Yeah, we are looking some. We're, uh, we're looking some in Poland. Uh, you're seeing a lot of press in Argentina. It, one is finding the good rock. You know, again, not all shale plays are the same. And then it's the physical terms in that country, the access to the resource. Uh, but we are looking at a number of places around the globe. Uh, it, it's emerging, as it will, slower around the rest of the globe than it has in the U.S. Um, but we are looking at that. One advantage we had in the U.S. really with the shale plays is the infrastructure was in place. You know, most of these shale plays are underlying where already had existing infrastructure, not for the not only for the oil transportation, but for the midstream and. Really, when you look in places like Poland, Argentina, and others, they just don't have that infrastructure in place. So that's going to drive, it's going to take slower for the development, you know, with the success there uh, to be able to get the kind of volumes. They definitely won't be able to see that ramp that we saw that was driven you know, by the fact we have infrastructure in place in the U.S. Do you see the expertise in, in tax of staying with the U.S. companies for a while, or do you see um, emergence from overseas, either? Majors or, or national oil companies, all the services. I think I think you'll see it across the board because the service companies uh, have a lot of that technology access and developing some of that technology, and and then they'll take it globally. Yeah. Will the uh, widening of the uh, Panama now have a uh, you know positive impact on uh, on the exports of oil products? I would think so. I'm probably not the right one to answer that one, but I can't imagine it not, not being a benefit, for sure. Yeah. follow up with um, another question with regards to our demand sort of flattening out and other developing companies expanding. You know, to what extent do you have to obviously deal with the geopolitical aspect of being able to go into those countries and be able to do the same amount of, I guess, exploration and development as you were allowed to in the U.S. where yeah, I, yeah. yeah and, and I don't know so much of geopolitical. I think it, the advantage, again, we had in the U.S. was you know, mostly private land ownership over where these shale plays were and existing infrastructure really just drove why, why it happened here first and why it happened here in, in such a big way. I, I think. No doubt. I don't think these shale plays are confined to North America. I think we're going to find uh, there's lots of them around the world, and it, it's just going to be the fact that we're going to probably be dealing with governments versus private landowners in a, a lot of places to be able to get access rights. And, and then as we find, find it, we're not going to have an immediate ability to put it into a pipeline within a weeks or months like we can in South Texas and North Dakota and uh, Haynesville, et cetera. So it's going to take years to build that infrastructure, the midstream infrastructure, et cetera. So I, I think it's happening. It's just going to be on a much slower pace uh, as you would as almost kind of the, if you will, new ventures type exploration where you're coming into an area that really doesn't have the existing infrastructure 
and you're and you are dealing with the government uh, more often than not for the access to those reserves and and resources. Question, and how, I'll say this in the most politically correct way, but obviously there are issues with you know, partnership with Venezuela. Let's say, for instance, you partner with the Chinese government. You know, how much are you guys? tuned into um, the pitfalls that could occur when we start doing something like that. Well, in, with any project that we take on, whether on exploration side or on the capital project side, we, you know, we do uh, thorough risk assessments, not only technical risk, but political risk um, and, and stability. And that, and that just goes into the equation of something we look at. Uh, as, you, as you saw, you know, we are heavily focused on the OECD countries. Uh, but it, it doesn't preclude looking at that if it's the right opportunity and, and as we do that evaluation of risk. But it is something we just factor into as we look at, at, at con you know, new country entry, if you will, uh, and the stability in the past and as we evaluate the stability going forward. Yes. <clears throat> you mentioned that the underskilled workforce has a major problem with your company and industry general. Um, I was wondering if you have any partnerships with universities or incentive programs or things like that to encourage a skilled workforce. Yeah, we, we've done some of that past, and I think we're going to start doing a lot more of it. I know we did some stuff with Southwest Louisiana in, in the past when I managed the, uh, the the properties in Louisiana. I think we're going to continue to look at that. We're also even looking at the universities and saying, you know, what, how can you help us with certification programs that maybe just provide the one, two year, or even just coursework. Uh, one area I'm familiar with, if I look at subsea engineering, uh, we really had no degree programs specific for subsea engineering in the U.S. It was really limited to uh, North Sea. I think there was one school in England or the U uh, U.K. or Aberdeen, and then there was one um, in Singapore. We now have the University of Houston has created a master's program in subsea. Texas A&M is looking into it and looking at also having certificate courses to be able to provide expertise uh, for the people who might need to maintain some of that equipment and such. So um, right now probably the majority of our focus uh, is really trying to find the petrotechs, the geologists, geophysicists, petroleum engineers, and working with the universities. Uh, the university enrollment has ramped up, uh, which has helped, but the demand for that ramp up is, is greater than ever. So uh, we're, we're, we're probably working both sides and we're probably working the petrotechs a little bit ahead of, of what we need on the if, if we will, the trades, but there's something we definitely need to do and, and probably not just do with our industry because a lot of those trades are not unique to what I need offshore or what we need for the, the unconventionals. It's the same thing the petrochemical industry is going to need in some of the manufacturing and how can we work together through trade organizations to be able to do that collaboration. I think we have, yeah, I'm sorry. You mentioned the Arctic briefly. How does the fact that you're seeing more commercial navigation in the Arctic change your supplying of the vessels and your operations? Well, it, we probably see it as, as a good thing because then they have the infrastructure up there. I mean, the, the one thing that will also drive slow development and exploration in the Arctic is just the lack of infrastructure up there, uh, whether it's refueling the ports, et cetera. So I, I think as the shipping, if the shipping increases up there, that's just going to drive infrastructure improvements. It's going to drive emergency response. Uh, set up both by the government and by industries and, and that, that has to be a positive for us. Uh, whether <coughs> Calgary up at, at Harvard, who's the next PNI planner, has said that it's going to be at least a generation before you see international shale development. And his main argument is that there's simply not the equipment or the expertise around to develop it sooner than that. And one of the statistics he gives is that half of the drilling rigs in the world are in the United States, and a good number of them are drilling shale right now. So what do you see, that you, first of all, do you agree with his timeline, and second of all, who do you see actually developing that equipment and personal expertise outside of the that's a good comment. Uh, our, our CEO, Ryan Lance, gave a speech recently. He's talking about when we got into Poland, there was only one rig in Europe that could drill a horizontal well. There was only one set of equipment to even hydraulically fracture a well in all of Europe. So, so when you're starting with one, uh, obviously the infrastructure is not there. And I, I don't know about the time frame where there's a full generation, but I think it, it's fair to say it's, it's not going to be rapid. It's, I think it's going to take someone finding a large enough resource that can justify that company working with the service sector to say we will are willing to invest um, and it can't probably be just one field one play it's going to have to be a larger play 
in a region that justifies that, and, and whether it's a Europe-based, Asia-Pacific base. But I, I think it'll happen. It's just again, yeah, like you said, it's the time frame is it a, a generation? Um, it, it's, it's probably closer to decades for it to really start developing on a, a global basis from what we've seen in the U.S. Just given, like I said, the lack of infrastructure is is huge, and it's definitely something we've seen. To add to that, I was in Saudi Arabia a few weeks ago, and they did their assessment on their shell plate. And it took the president time to look for 70 rigs, and they oh, can't find them. Seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's... Good uh, news for rig guns. Yeah, yeah, there will be a lot of new rig bills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, then if there's no more questions, thank you so right. much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much again for this uh, great uh, insights. Uh, I just uh, one or two uh, more things. I uh, would like to thank the sponsors, first NBC Bank, as well as Jones Walker, for uh, uh, really uh, helping us out. And uh, because without of, uh, them, this would not be possible. As well as, uh, please be tuned. We will have also next year another executive speaker series. We will roll out the different dates and, and speakers. Uh, as well uh, and I guess uh, before we hear too much of the music uh, next door we call it uh, adjourned thank you again for coming